Welcome to the first technical breakout session. Today we're going to have two sessions back to back with Sarah and I. A little bit of an intro introduction. Uh, my name is Fatih Hildes, and I'm a technical product manager in Page Builder Engine team. But I also see um, developer experience holistically. So um, I'm all ears to hear you know, all of your developer experience um, throughout like our experience. Hi, um, and I'm Sarah Carruthers. I lead the product team um, focusing on experiences. So that includes um, page builder, page builder engine, themes, our web CDN um, and web gateway, and our mobile SDKs, everything that's really related to the reader experience side. So in this first session, we're going to talk about developer speed. Um, and you know we're going to try to um, look into, um, first, look into drivers uh, of speed, how um, developer teams move fast at Arc XP ecosystem. We're going to look into a couple tactics, um, and including Sarah is going to cover uh, using themes to move fast. Um, then we're going to um, touch on a couple challenges that we want to acknowledge, you know, some of the challenges. We're not going to cover everything, but we're going to talk about the uh, biggest ones. And while we talk about these challenges, we're going to talk about um, how we think about uh, solving or addressing some of these challenges. Uh, so we're going to show you guys some of the items in our roadmap, uh, near term as well as long term, um, coming um, in our roadmap. First, we're going to um, start looking in what are the drivers of speed, um, like what are the elements that teams move fast at Arc. Um, and starting with, we want to show you guys a couple data points that how we observe teams deploying uh, changes at Arc ecosystem. So this is going to be mostly like page builder activities. Um, our conversation is going to be <laughs> So our conversation is going to be mostly focused on experience building, digital experiences, and page builder heavy. Um, but starting with um, how frequently the you know, teams deploying um, future changes. We're happy to see majority of our clients making multiple deployments a week, some doing daily deployments, which is, which is really, really healthy. And we want to say one um, you know, grain of salt that this is a refined data only looking at deployment, uh, production deployments. There's obviously, you know, much more frequent activities in non-production environments. And how you make deployments matter. And uh, one of the signals that we see in a very positive way that automating your deployment, deployment workflow um, is a good indicator that, you know, teams doing this, teams utilizing uh, automations in non-production environments, they deploy twice as fast than teams don't. And this is obviously comparing like, you know, pre-production activities, teams doing automations on uh, testing uh, phases, that they do make production deployments twice as fast. So we want to cover a couple tactics um, of, you know, increasing speed, increasing confidence when you make deployments. And there are two themes, two strong themes on this. Uh, one of them is confidence. Like when you make changes, how are you become, you know, ensuring that those changes are not breaking anything? Uh, it's one of the key, it's debatable that, you know, it's, it's the only way to make sure like move fast, right? So another theme that, uh, you know, how fast you can act when you detect issues, you know, when you um, see any reader experience impact uh, of your deployments, and how fast you can roll things back to previous state, uh, because solution might not be, you know, very quick solution. So starting with confidence, uh, we talk about testing. Or actually, we didn't talk about testing. Uh, testing is key, um, and it's maybe the only way to scale, you know, software development to a speed that you can make daily deployments or move fast. Especially if you have like larger teams, you know, uh, more team members in your uh, in your organization, perhaps like multiple squads working in parallel. Um, and we want to talk about like three areas, and the reason being there's no silver bullet, there's no framework that covers all the grounds, right? So, um, and this is not an extensive list, but it's 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 a big you know coverage for um, testing your bundle 
uh, feature changes so you can ship confidently. And uh, one of the areas, uh, we're going to talk about some of the assumptions as well, but one of the areas to start with is you know, how your um, content is being rendered, how it's presented uh, to your readers. So we're talking about pixels here. Uh, maybe you know, your content is labeled in a certain way. That label needs to be rendered in a green color versus red color. Um, you know, at, at that layer, we're talking about you know, um, presentation layers in your page builder engine, you know, future pack, which is your features, chains, layouts, you know, your output types. These are your presentation layers. And since we're native to the React world, we're talking about like React components. Um, they're very deterministic, it's easy to test, um, and they can be you know, covered with any framework that does um, component-based test testing. But this operates under the assumption that your rendering layers has everything it needs to render. It can be your you know, custom fields values or you know, the type of content it needs for coming from con your content sources. That brings us to the second point, that, which is pre probably the most critical in your you know, page builder stack your content sources, because content sources uh, handle, you know, their main purpose is handling your data, and most of the time you're operating, you know, one or multiple APIs. It can be Arc APIs or external APIs, and APIs can behave in many different ways. We often think about the happy path, you know, I'm gonna query a collection, and I'm expecting five stories to render a, you know, most read stories collection on the sidebar, right? But are you, you know, thinking about the scenarios that what if your editors are not publishing any articles if the collection is completely empty, or if it has like 10 you know, stories in the collection? Um, these are sort of like more logical scenarios, but content sources, just because APIs can behave in many different ways, they can return rate limiting responses, they can return like any error messages or even outages. So your content sources, since they are mostly operates under the hood, um, they're one of the areas that you can cover with um, unit testing, you know, frameworks uh, should be you know, able to, um, you know, give you guys very easy to, you know, implement path. But the goal here in content sources is to cover as many, you know, behaviors that content sources can behave. Because anything you guys are not thinking may happen, and Murphy's Law, it will happen, and when it happens, it may directly impact uh, your render you know, page, either server-side render or client-side render, and eventually it will impact your reader's experience. And the last area is probably the most difficult, is how your staff is interacting with each other through Arc tools, right? Your content creators, maybe they have to do from your workflow requirements. They have to enter certain things in your composer power-ups or custom fields in Page Builder. And what happens if they don't enter stuff, or if they, if they copy-paste the raw HTML in, in a text field that's supposed to have just like a couple sentences, right? So covering page builder scenarios is relatively easy with end-to-end -end tests, because you can spin up a page builder you know, instance on your local computer or on your test environments, but how about like Composer or Site Service or other Arc you know, tools? Um, there are ways to go beyond like authentication layer and completely you know, automate end-to-end -end testing um, to cover these interactions between different staff members. Again, that's not extensive list, but it covers a lot of ground. And implementing testing is not too difficult at Arc. Um, this is a Cypress, one of the you know, more popular frameworks. Within just like 30 lines, we, we just wanted to demonstrate um, there are like four you know, key behaviors that can be squeezed in in this very simple, you know, test spec that, ren you know, that can test your render outcome, your PF API calls for front-end, you know, client refresh, and custom uh, fields behavior in editor UI, right? Maybe your developer team is defining a content uh, custom field in a certain, you know, way, like an integer or, a, you know, number needs to be entered there, but you know, how it's being reflected in Editor UI is something that you can programmatically test to increase your confidence. So we do have a, you know, short demo. These two are supposed to be in the same slides just because of the resolution we split them. But this is Cypress doing end-to-end -end testing, you know, just opening Page Builder, navigating to a page, changing a custom field called like country code, and it's observing its changes in the preview 
which gives you a lot of like surface area within just like couple, you know, use cases. Again, like this is just a demo. It's not to say that it's easy, you know, testing. Um, I think I have another slide that I covered that testing is an investment. It's not going to be easy. It's, it requires like time to, you know, get to a level that you feel comfortable that your automations or tests covering a lot of, you know, different scenarios. As you grew into, you know, having more complicated features or more complex workflows baked into your render stack. So render stack is the last mile, but it, it kind of like emerges everything. Your, you know, different staff members, you know, um, uh, bring everything together into final reader experience. So um, we talk about like automation um, in a sense that this slide is, you know, titled just maybe deployment activities to be automated, but more key here is this workflow. Basically, your developer team starting from creating a, you know, pull request in your repository as the kickoff process. And whatever the steps you have, including your CI, you know, CI CD integration that covers like your unit tests, your performance tests, or we're gonna cover you know, performance tests with budget, you know, setting budgets, which can be completely automated within this process. But the end goal is your definition of what is the point that we checked all the boxes needs to be checked and we're ready to be mentally ready to be deploy this change, that now we have high confidence that this is showing signals that maybe 98% of the features that we have for our readers experience not gonna blow up, right? And when your developer team, you know, finish working on a uh, feature or a bug fix, let's say you, fin you check all the boxes with automation or main maybe like manual, you know, steps, and you deploy it, it doesn't end there. Um, you know, having a strong, you know, confidence will also require making sure, like, you know, you didn't move the needle in negative way, our first concern, but also positive way um, in reader's experience. Like, positive way is obviously is the desired outcome, but monitoring your deployment activities is key, you know, behavior here that uh, even for positive scenarios, let's say your, you know, your developer team worked on a thing that uh, optimized your server-side render, um, sorry, client side render to, you know, um, render the content in key areas of your site. It's important to monitor, you, you know, um, have some KPI set and be on top of that when you make deployment activities. Uh, one of the areas, we're going to show a dashboard that we recently launched that will help you, you know, um, see this out of box without doing extra, you know, um, like tracking. But also another area is to um, understand your render stack is behaving normally. And best way to do that is analyzing your logs. Like what is your log volume? What are the changes before and after, you know, making deployment? And we're going to talk about, you know, some challenges and, you know, some solutions about logs um, as well. So we talk about, you know, this dashboard. This is, um, this is available to all clients since last week. Uh, it's called Page Builder Render Dashboard. Uh, it's available in your Arc Admin delivery tiles, and we do have a section um, like a sub navigation dashboards. This is one of the new dashboards that has a lot of information. Uh, it can be overwhelming. We do have an AC ALC doc, uh, corresponding ALC doc, you know, touches and explains every single box you see in this dashboard. It's a lot of information, but there are three key metrics that we want to highlight here is in this bottom corner. It's directly in correlated with your deployment health. So um, your team made a change, and first thing you want to know is like, what is my render success and failure ratio? Is there any change on that, right? Another thing, you know, another indicator that we do have like render size, um, is your HTML, you know, output is, is now bigger or smaller, or also your render uh, timing. Is it like faster or slower now? These are directly correlated with your deployments. And this dashboard has beautiful functionality. It's not super visible, but we do have these vertical markers in trend charts that highlights your key deployment activities, which is promoting a bundle to production or terminating a bundle. It's a distractive action. That if that is showing any change in your, in your trends, that's a you know, very easy to way, way to see that direct correlation with your deployment caused something. Again, this doesn't have to be negative signals. It can be positive signals as well. Um, this is available to all clients right now. 
When we talk about logs, logs can be really powerful because it's not just errors or you know, signals, like bad signals, right? Because logs contain everything your application tells to, like leaves traces um, in, our, in our system, right? And you have full control on you know, what it tells uh, and it's, it's tracked in the logs. You can include your performance metrics, you can include like logical behaviors. Let's say there's a content source is needing like Google Analytics API, Google Analytics data to render like, you know, most read articles. What happens if that API call fails? Or what happens if that API takes super long time? You may implement a logic to fall back to a WebSkit collection, and that is gonna be still successful render outcome, right? It's not gonna surface itself as errors or failures, but logs is the only way to measure that. And Arc is, Arc is agnostic to tooling. Arc, you know, logs are is a little bit of a you know sour spot because we don't we don't do you know we don't give you guys logs or log access easily. You have to request you know log access. You have to you know set up your own AWS account. You have to figure out your own tooling, which is it can be a good thing or a bad thing because you you are free to choose any log you know solution you know out there to you know store index and analyze your logs and create your own monitoring you know um, dashboards and you know um, see the anomalies happening in your application output right we do have a few examples here um, some of our we have seen all of these you know examples like cloudwatch is aws native solution um, but it's not as rich as you know something like Kibana, Elasticsearch, you know uh, Stack, or some clients we have seen more enterprise solutions like Splunk uh, being used. Most of these tools have similar flavors, um, you know, different different uh, functionalities, but they will come with like very strong searching and mon you know dashboard charting and um, alerting capabilities that you will want. Okay. Um so yeah, Fatih, I think, talked a lot about um, some specific, thank you, um, engineering tactics to you know, build confidence and launch new features faster. Um, I'm gonna talk about another uh, potential method, which is using our Themes product. Um, some of you may be familiar with Themes or use it already. Uh, for those who aren't, I'm gonna give an overview. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about some things we have coming up on the roadmap. Um, so to start with, you know, Themes is our out-of-the-box website product, and our goals are that you can spend less time launching new sites, um, more time focusing on differentiators that are really important for your business. I think this relates really well to what um, Mike was talking about earlier about having like a start list and a stop list. So the idea is you can use Themes and stop maintaining, you know, like common parts of your site, like an article template, um, you know, especially the things that connect with other ARC tools like photo galleries, videos, um, collections. You know, we build blocks to integrate with those services so that you can use our version and spend more time, you know, focusing on things that are more unique to your business. Um, so here's a sampling of some of the blocks we have. Um, as you can see, they really focus on promoting content. So there's, you know, like an article template, video players, and a lot of different blocks that we call just promo blocks. They promote stories. You can put them on the home page, um, recirculation at the bottom of the article page, all that kind of stuff. And this, um, you can use these to construct pages and templates in Page Builder. And I'll kind of talk about that next. Um, so again, if you're not familiar with themes, I kind of want to give a visualization of where does it fit in to the ARC ecosystem? Um, this is Page Builder, and this is what Page Builder would look like if you were starting to build a new site today and you weren't using themes. Um, page Builder is a really wonderful platform for, uh, you know, a WYSIWYG tool to build pages, but first you have to get a library of building blocks to actually construct those pages. Um, so as you can see here, there's no blocks available to add. If you're starting on your own from scratch, you have to build all those blocks first before you can then construct them into pages and templates. So what we want to provide with themes is a full library of blocks out of the box. Um, that's what you can see here. Now there is, um, you know, this all of these different options for 
uh, blocks to build your page with zero development effort. Um, we also provide starter pages and templates. So again, instead of really starting from scratch and having to figure out um, what your article template is going to look like, what your video template is going to look like, we provide templates that you can start with. And then, of course, you can use uh, Page Builder Editor to add blocks, rearrange blocks, um, you know, create totally new layouts. But we give you that starting point so you're not just facing like a blank page at the beginning. Um, these are some of the examples of the templates. Uh, like I said, really focused on content. Um, so content templates like an article template, section fronts, home page. Um, we have a lot of other templates uh, that you can start with as well. And then one thing that's um, really important to us is that you can extend themes. Um, so we may not have blocks for every possible use case um, that you you know, that your organization needs, especially as those use cases get a little bit more specific and differentiated. So we enable you to add custom blocks and mix and match them with the themes blocks. So you could have, say, you know, a lot of your homepage and your article template and your video template using themes blocks, but maybe you want to build some custom blocks for things that are really unique to your organization. Um, this example is, you know, a financial publication Maybe having a stock ticker and financial data is important to your readers, and you know you really want to focus on providing value to your readers there. So what we really recommend is, you know, using custom blocks for that kind of thing, and mix and match them with the themes blocks. Um, you can also use the themes design system to style these blocks so that it looks consistent. Um, you know, for your end reader, they shouldn't know that some of this is built by us and some of the this is built by you. It's, our goal is really to make it like seamless and consistent and let you focus on the things, like I said, that are like most critical to your business and um, the, the differentiators. So we also have um, an admin application where you can configure you know, key uh, aspects of your site, like some of the branding settings. Um, add integration IDs, analytics integration IDs, all that kind of stuff that you need to configure on a site-by-site -site basis, uh, which is really helpful, especially for our customers that run a ton of publications, like hundreds of publications. You can go in and change, you know, if the logo needs to be updated, you can go into the UI and just change the logo, do a deployment, it gets on the site. Um, and our first version of themes, if you're familiar with it, uh, it has a pretty limited set of styling configurations that we make available. We have the primary and secondary font family, one accent color, and the logos, of course, in terms of providing that like unique branding. And really, the top requests we heard from customers over the past couple of years is a lot of people want to use themes, but they have you know unique styles for their um, publication. There's an existing brand guide that they need to make their website match. Um, and so that is what we've been working on adding support for, which is what we're calling block styling. This is a release that's coming out um, in, we'll be starting a beta at the end of Q2 and available for everybody in Q3. And really, um, we wanted to allow for significant styling customization. So beyond just selecting the font family, now you'll be able to control the font size, the line height, the letter spacing, um, you know, which font family is used for which component, like really full CSS control over the whole typography. You'll be able to choose um, the entire color palette. And then the part that I'm kind of most excited about is also being able to override styling of components, um, components and blocks. So for example, the button um, is a, you know, component that's used around or across a lot of different blocks. So this is showing just one example of what, you know, a styled news site could look like. Um, and then, you know, this is like a second example of a totally different brand uh, just by changing, you know, some colors, some the fonts and the components, you can get a more distinct look and feel. So in this example, um, you know, we've changed like the button styling. It's got those rounded corners as opposed to these square corners. There's um, the label that appears over the headline. Uh, the styling has been changed. That's a really good opportunity for like uh, branding and differentiating on news websites. 
you know, you can add background colors to the labels. It's really, um, we're giving you control to override all of those components used across the box. And then even further than that, um, the ability to override components within specific blocks. So maybe you want your buttons to look one way across most of your site, but in the navigation you need it to look slightly different. You'll be able to have that level of control. Um, this is another example, again, kind of taking the same basic um, you know, components and typography, but just applying different styling choices to get a more unique look and feel. Um, so themes will still come fully styled out of the box like it is today. Like our 2.0 version will look the same when you get it, um, but the difference is now you'll be able to go in and change um, these styling files that you couldn't access before. So we'll have more information on this um, in the next couple months. You'll start seeing release notes about it. Um, definitely come talk to me after if you're interested. I'd love to connect, get your feedback. Um, but yeah, I really wanted to share this uh, to kind of give you some ideas in case, you know, you may have taken a look at themes before and it wasn't the right fit for you. Um, definitely encourage you to take another look because I think it'll be a lot more useful for, you know, organizations that really need that finer grained level control over their look and feel. Um, and I think, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention, just talking about testing, you know, we have unit testing, um, component testing, end-to-end -end testing set up for all the blocks. So it's kind of like less that you have to worry about. Um, you can just focus your time on those custom blocks. I also would recommend, um, you know, if you're getting started with uh, Arc Identity or Arc Subscriptions, we have blocks for those. So you can, um, at the very least, you know, you can use them directly from themes or you could just look at them as a starting point for an integration and kind of like a code sample of how to put uh, a login button in the navigation and call the APIs for identity and get a paywall set up. So we kind of view it as also a, um, like a starting point for sample code as well. So yeah, um, this is just kind of showing like how we think about the spectrum of options for customers building a site on Arc. Um, down in the lower left corner, we have themes with Arc blocks. If you're just using themes out of the box, typically you can launch your site very quickly, um, zero to three months. You know, it's more on the out of the box side of the scale. Coming up to the top right here is building a fully custom site, which is also still an option. I haven't taken that away. Um, it generally takes longer because you have to build that library of blocks yourself, of course, but it is, you know, offers more customization. And then there's really a spectrum in the middle that can vary depending on your organization's needs. You might use themes and add some custom blocks. Um, you know, the more you add, the more you go kind of custom, um, the longer it typically takes, but that may be the right decision for your organization. And also, um, there's an option that some of our customers do, which is they take themes, they start with it, um, again, to get to market kind of quickly, and then they decide they want to, you know, really fully own the code base themselves, go in a different direction, and they can fork themes. So these are all kind of options. Um, and, you know, you can choose the right, the best option for, depending on the needs of your organization and your brand. Okay, I'll hand it back to Fatih. All right, thank you. So we don't want to say everything is word is all pink and nice. Um, there's some challenges, including like our you know current solutions. We want to talk about some of the big limitations, and you know how we think about solving them. There are a couple different features that I'm going to talk about, but there's a theme. A um, couple problems that we identify are under this bigger umbrella of, you know, developer teams, especially growing or larger developer teams, their workflows are limited in a sense that um, the way you ship code requires coordination and tight coordination in some cases, depending on how critical the changes you are pushing, the sizes of the features that you're delivering. And w we definitely, you know, are collecting data points and we want to talk about like these this is my bread and butter. Like, I really want to understand. Like, you know, if you are facing any different color version of this this workflow problems, um, I'm happy to you know talk to you after after the session. But uh, generally, the way it manifests is, um, let's say in this example picture, you have like three squads or 
you know, pods or developer teams with different sizes. And they can be working in either isolated parts of your sites. Let's say team A works on you know, a feature set, let's say subscriptions, much more business critical and you know, other parts of the um, you know, teams that are working on, maybe they're working on closer you know, features or perhaps like same features in different times, but in different you know, agendas, right? This, the, you know, regardless of the size of the work is done, the way usually we observe, you know, Arc, you know, team developer teams work operating in Arc. The way they, you know, develop a feature, usually one or can be multiple developers taking a feature or a bug that they are going to work work on. And you know, in um, Agile model, you take a ticket and create a feature branch, work on it, and when it's time, you know, for you know testing or handing over to QA team, if you have either individual QA team members for per pod, or maybe one QA team, or developer team is the QA team. In, you know, again, like, you know, this manifests itself in any, like, different shape or form um, based on different team sizes. But the way we see is, at least the Arc solution, we provide multiple environments, right? Production is obviously where it needs to go at the end, but you do have, like, pre-production environments. And in each environment, you have preview slots it's out of box deployer capability, but you, you get like 10 on deck bundles and you can test, you can use nine of them for, for your testing um, in Arc environment. Again, like going back to the testing strategy, you can test a lot of stuff locally or in test isolated test environments. If it's a presentation layer or data, you know, con content source behavior, but if it's a power up or if it, if it needs like everything Arc, right? Like site service, API, content and everything. Arc environments are the only way to test those type of changes, right? So we've seen like, you know, there's a QA efforts happen in different, you know, lanes, but they all have to align and slowly, you know, sort of merge into single lane. And what single lane means, like you only have one page builder instance in production and that code base has to be, you know, tested in whatever many steps you have before into single lane and ship at once, right? You may utilize other type of tests, but this is sort of like, you know, Arc providing, you know, a platform capabilities to, you know, work with. And we have a couple features to, you know, either short term to give you guys a little bit more breathing room or long term that we're going to talk about in further slides. But first, this is Deployer 2.0. Um, even though half of our clients use automated deployments, we still interact with Deployer and I don't want to, you know, prioritize the, like, it's design refresh. More importantly, the limit that we talk about, 10 on-deck bundles, which is this top table. Obviously, we have right now five, you know, bundles here. But when you hit the limit, you have to remove one of these slots, free it up in order to, you know, deploy a bundle to test it in, you know, Arc um, ecosystem. So we're increasing on-deck bundles from 10 to 20 on non-production environments. Um, it's intentionally not, we're not providing that on production environments because, you know, you should be using like non-production environments like staging sandbox developer uh, environments. But on all of those environments, you will have like more breathing room to utilize this for, you know, across your teams now. And along with, you know, that under the hood, more impactful change, we're doing a, you know, design refresh. It includes some UX improvements, namely, you know, deployer history was, you know, had a lot of smaller cracks. You know, it used to be a smaller panel. And if, you, if you've been deploying, if you've been, you know, a long client, you may have like thousands of deployments and filtering, sifting them through, seeing like last failed deployment or things like that for your, you know, sort of uh, reference uh, work. It, it was difficult. And now, you know, we have bigger um, real estate to provide you more labels and status, um, you know, uh, information that you can easily get to, you know, fail deployments, download their logs and um, work with it. But again, these are smaller, you know, improvements. It's more important that you have more uh, on-deck bundle slots to work with right now. Another area, this is one of the most voted ID on page builder side. Um, edit, page builder editor team is working on a UI version of this feature right now to provide you ways to synchronize page builder data only without doing like imports, exports, 
um, individual pages to replicate a, an environment page builder data with a couple clicks um, to non-production environments. If you see, like those arrows one way intentionally because we don't want you know to provide an automated way to push the non-production page builder data back to production. That can be quite distractive. It's independently happening on parallel, uh, but it's very related. We're also uh, looking ways to uh, provide page builder data uh, programmatically, so you can automate uh, your testing environments as outside of ARC environments. You can access to PEB data either via API or a you know, CLI function, something like something along the lines that you know, MPX Fusion copy data from environment name would be a command that you can run and start your you know, Fusion instance, which is probably most applicable for local developer experience to just quickly pull production data and run your tests uh, with production you know, page builder data. So going back to that workflow problem, there's a reason that you have to merge everything into single lane. And it's a very logistical problem or limitation. Uh, we've been labeling it as like single bundle limitation. And bundle being like you only get to have single page builder instance per environment. Obviously, production is the one that we are most interested in, right? How can we allow different developers to work in parallel, independently from each other? And more importantly, deploy code independently from each other, right? So the single, you know, this is a visualization. It's just a, it's just a screenshot taken from a disk you know, utilization application, but it describes the single bundle limitation. So your bundle has to contain pretty much everything, every type of reader functionality you ship to your readers. That can include both mission critical stuff or one site specific, you know, feature in it, um, or, you know, areas that you need to update in daily basis, like maybe your homepage, your, your election map, needs to be updated in the election week or election days. So we're actively exploring. That's why there's an intentional light bulb <laughs> in that area. This is a big initiative, but we think like this is the um, probably the you know, true solution to the limitation, workflow limitation that we, we just touched on. This demonstrates the current you know, uh, architecture that you get like single bundle, whether you are a large single site organization Let's use WashingtonPost.com. That may have like you know, 20 different teams, developer teams working in parallel. That currently they have to work all together to you know ship their changes at once, right? Or whether you're a big broadcaster, you have many TV stations or radio channels, lifestyle brands. You may have like 100 different sites powered by a single engine, right? So with multi-engine, essentially allowing you to have multiple bundles powering your sites. That can be wired in any shape or you know shape or form. Whether you have you know single large site that different engines would be responsible to render different parts of your like sections of your site, like we use sports um, in this example. Your sports bundle may have you know live game scores or leaderboards or you know heavy features that shouldn't belong into your you know homepage or other parts, right? Or big broadcaster example that you may have like clusters of sites that they have distinct capabilities that you want to isolate them. But more importantly, provide flexibility and freedom to deploy these in, in their own schedules, right? Because this doesn't necessarily direct solution to having like 100 teams working in parallel versus having like one large team, you know, working in a lot of initiatives at, at once. But they need to move fast in one lane and maybe same developers, you know, doing um, changes into more mission critical, you know, business critical parts um, with more testing, right? So going back to that, like single bundle, it may look like something like this. You may recognize some of these like orange boxes exist everywhere. So there's some overlaps. There's some concerns that like, how do we overcome the, you know, points that multiple bundles? It's not going to be like you have three megabyte you know, client-side bundle, and it's going to be perfectly split like one megabyte, one megabyte, one megabyte, right? So there's still areas that we need to, you know, uncover. But the point here is, you know, good example is like subs bundle that can be much more minimal. And the burden of all of those capabilities now off of, you know, every other bundle. But more importantly, you know, different teams can own, you know, these parts. 
and maybe work in isolation completely and move fast compared to like other teams. This is a you know visualization of like deployment frequency. You know, something like subscriptions, we've been keep referring it as like a business critical area. Probably it is because you have your identity, your checkout, your payment processing, payrolls, and all of the logic there. But maybe your election gets a little bit crazier as you get closer to the election that you need to move like really fast. So this removes the risk and removes the risk of confidence loss when you make, when your election team needs to move really fast. There's always concern that, are they going to blow up like our paywalls? Are they going to blow up our you know, homepage? So in summary, multi-engines, you know, bigger goal is like providing flexibility to developer teams to, to create parallel work streams, right? To decrease um, lower risks. Um, you know, having multiple bundles also mean that you can be much more aggressive to optimize reader experience on any given one, meaning that each of your bundle will be much slimmer and renders fast, right? So we are looking in, you know, performance, you know, gains on this as well. But ev eventually, like, we're talking about uh, developer team efficiency. So we, some of you have been seeing multi-engine. We've been talking, you know, a lot of, like, clients, and we've been really happy seeing, like, very positive interest. Uh, but we're still laying out our uh, use cases for multi-engine because it's a big feature. It can solve a lot of problems, which is also the danger. We, don't, we, we need to really be, you know, sure uh, that we're addressing, maximizing our first version to, you know, provide the maximum, you know, value. Um, with that, it comes with some challenges, right? It's a big cross-team initiative. Uh, it's a little bit scary, to be honest. Um, but three teams need to work very closely um, in page builder, you know, especially experiences pod. Um, so it's a foundational change. Uh, it's one of the architectural, you know, early architectural decision that uh, we're trying to reevaluate some of the pieces to make sure that we don't disrupt the current workflows because not everybody, every organization will opt in to use multi-engine. But if you're interested in, I'm super happy to, you know, talk after the session or, you know, throughout the conference. Um, so we want to, you know, say, we want to just close this, this section with saying, like, um, we're early in development and we're, we're still evaluating, you know, um, what are the commonalities between, you know, all of our, you know, clients that we want to, you know, uh, provide that developer efficiency uh, to all of you. That was, that multiple things was about the first challenge that we talk about, like, developer teams workflow challenges. Now we want to quickly talk about like a couple areas that uh, we also have some stuff coming in your way. Uh, we talk about like logs are not our you know, best area that we're not, you know, uh, it's not easy to um, work with logs. Um, it requires skill. It requires like access to the logs, write logs. And uh, it's not every developer's cup of tea. And, you know, getting access to logs is also not easy. You have to do a lot of homework to set yourself for success, right? This is not a, like, ultimate solution, but for the main use case, which is when things go wrong, my page doesn't render, or my page renders slow or has stale content. Where um, the development work is done with this initiative, and, you know, some of you have seen, you know, mock-ups or early versions of this. This is actually final, you know, ish product that... Uh, we're introducing a new debugger tool called page, band, uh, page Render Debugger. Essentially, you enter a URI of a page. Let's say, you know, your sports page, sports section page doesn't render a block, right? It renders empty or something's up. That you can, you know, enter the URL, debug the, you know, page build, page render. It will create a render session without cache. Obviously, it will take longer to render because there's no cache, but it will execute every single content source, every single render block, which will surface whatever there is, you know, whatever is the problem, it will surface itself. Either the high-level outputs, like HTTP status code, the size or the timing, or more importantly, the role logs. This demonstrates an error message here, but it doesn't have to be error message. It can be still successful render, but you're profiling like every block's render timing to optimize it, you can now use this uh, feature, to, you know, in Arc um, environments without doing extra, you know, 
um, access to logs or analysis work. And last area that I want to touch is we're aware that our local development experience can, you know, can be improved in many ways. Namely, running page builder stack locally is not something that, you know, it's like every developer machine will, will handle. It requires sophisticated machines. It's a heavy Docker you know, stack, and we're aware of it. We're also really annoyed about it, that there are areas that, there are multiple areas that we're exploring, uh, and some of them are, we're really you know, happy that uh, there's going to be initiatives that we will be uh, improving you know, speed concerns. Um, our CLI takes a lot of time to rebuild, especially rebuild times. Like first time builds, we understand there's a lot of like style customizations, multiple sites you may have, and we have to render a lot of things um, to make, make sure like, you know, your bundle is ready for uh, handling like any type of page uh, you have in the editor side. Um, but especially like rebuilding, most of the time developers, when they are working on a feature, they're working on like just very narrow scope of area. And when they, you know, rebuild or uh, restart their engine instance, it takes as long as, like, you know, starting from scratch. And the last area is our CLI output is very chatty. It's super verbose. It tells you everything. And what I mean by everything is, like, even stuff that you, you shouldn't care, you shouldn't, you know, know. So we're working on, like, ver verbosity, um, you know, settings to give you guys a little bit cleaner output, only stuff that you should know, and especially correct signals that when engine is busy building, when it successfully finished, or when it failed with a clear stack trace. It's not readable on the screen, but um, that's sort of like a high-level mock-up that we're, we're shooting for. Um, and the other area is obviously a little bit more together. Um, both at the same time, we're trying to lighten up our you know, local developer stack, how it runs, and you know, increase our build times. So I want to wrap up uh, with, you know, I'll wrap up our session with saying, like, um, I'm personally being an advocate for, you know, client developers. I'm coming from an engineering background. And, you know, both feeling, feeling really passionate about, you know, the challenges you face and, you know, potential solutions you may have. I'm, like, all ears to, you know, listen. Um, I'm also tasked to, you know, lead the, drive the developer experience throughout, like, we talk about page builder heavy, you know, um, stack, or the solutions and uh, challenges here. But really anything your developers face, uh, I'm curious to hear you know, rest of the session. Um, we do have ambitious goals for improving our developer experience. There is a bigger focus um, at Arc uh, that we're working on. And um, you know, Sarah and I were you know, happy to talk throughout the you know, conference, after the conference as well. We also have Arc advice sessions that you guys can block like you know very short 15 minutes it's going to be like very brief chat but we're happy to you know meet with you um all of you well, thank you yeah oh and our survey as well oh yes um <laughs> <laughs> this qr code is there for a reason so we only covered like just few very impactful problems and challenges developer teams face but we do have a very quick like stack ranking drag and drop easy you know survey we want to hear like if there's any other um challenge that you face we already included a couple you know, items. It's just drag and drop and sort whatever is most important for you uh, beyond the three you know, initiatives that, or three challenges that we touched on. Uh, we would love to hear um, your feedback on this. Yeah. No, um, yeah, and definitely encourage you to like, please come up to us. You know, we want to hear more afterwards, um, the ARC advice session. Um, but anywhere else, definitely our goal is to you know, hear from you all like what is top of your mind and, and most important for your development um, experience. So yeah, thank you all. Um, and yeah, Fatih and I are actually yeah. doing the next presentation in here as well, but I think we'll take like a five minute break or so. Um, yeah, but um, if you have any questions, like mm -hmm. we had this 10 minute remainder 10 minutes oh, yeah. for like any questions, <laughs> if you have any questions. Yeah, one second. <laughs> hey, hey, Taylor is my name here. I was just going to uh, ask you what is the uh, recommended minimum system requirements for page builder to run? Right now, our documentation says um, six gigabyte memory. Memory is the biggest one, is because if you're use if you have complex bundle, 
it needs to watch everything, including like your SAS files, CSS files, or your React files. In, in a lot of clients, use TypeScript as well. So um, the bigger your bundle size will require more Docker, you know, containers to require more RAM. And it will slow down your build speed as well. But I think general guidance, we, we say 6 gigabyte, but usually practically we see like 8 gigabyte minimum uh, is, the, is the sweet spot. Uh, hi, this is Lowell uh, from Oregon Public Broadcasting. Uh, you mentioned something about um, allowing to copy page builder data between environments. Um, will that be just like the entire stack of page builder data, or could you migrate like a single page from one environment to another? Well, you can do a single page or a single template manually right now. Um, you know, go in like in page builder on the pages list in the three buttons menu you can export a page and then import that into another environment um but that's all like one by one like if you want to replicate your whole environment it's easier to just do what we're talking about here and it'll replace all of the data all the pages the templates the resolvers um yeah but are you thinking um it'd be helpful to have like an api because right now i guess the import export is primarily in the UI. Um, but if, it would, if you're thinking it would be helpful to have like an API-based way to do that, definitely let us know, you know. Yep. Hey, I'm Holly. Hi. Um, what's your timeline-ish for multi-engine? It's, yeah, I mean, likely, it's something we want to work on this year. Um, we want to make sure we're building the right solution. And like really, truly, we want to talk to you all about what you think it would be useful for, make sure we're um, you know, able to make something that solves a lot of use cases. So it's a focus for us researching this quarter. And then we'll probably have a better answer in a couple months. That's why I said ish, yeah. mm -hmm. ish, ish. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? OK. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Yeah, and we'll take, like I said, like a five-minute break before we get started. Thank you. Thanks.